What's going on, everybody? And welcome in to another edition of Be Shafe Daily. Brendan Schaefer here with you in the early morning hours of Wednesday, June 7th, 2023. As we continue to discuss a Cardinals team in free fall right now, which is really the way it feels as the Cardinals have lost now five consecutive games since they ended that 19 games and 19 day stretch. Remember the one that was giving them so much trouble in which they went 12 and seven, and then they had two consecutive off days and, and haven't won a game since. Yep. That's the very same stretch that we're talking about here for the Cardinals. And how interesting is that then that the Cardinals get the off days Okay, that's why the team's dragging a little bit. Offensively, the guys have been grinding. A lot of Cardinals fans didn't like the excuses. They thought that those were kind of excuses that the team was putting out there. I thought it was really more about just an explanation for the way things were going. But at a certain point, you know, you can't buy whatever you call them, excuses, explanations. You can't buy them as legitimate eventually, right? Right now, it's, oh, everybody's frustrated. Ollie Marmel talking after the game, Cardinals all talking about being frustrated, and they should be. They lose tonight to the Rangers, 6-4. to four. They get three home runs, but that's all the offense they come up with. Nice to see, though, by the way, the guys that do homer, Arenado, Contreras, and Walker. Jordan Walker with a just a moonshot bomb to left. If I could pick out of a lineup three Cardinals that I think it would be most beneficial to see those guys get going, and I could have hand-picked to, to see home runs from tonight, I probably would have chosen those three guys. Cardinals need Arenado to be Arenado. They need to see some signs from Jordan Walker after his recall. He's been a little suspect so far. Was able to get, get the ball in the air tonight, 430 feet to left. And Wilson Contreras, absolutely this team needs him to get going offensively. So there are positives to take away from it, aren't there always, when the Cardinals lose? You find the positives. You know, Matthew Libertor, the game line ends up looking probably worse than the performance. But then again, when you give up five runs, four of them earned, and, and you only get through four innings, he didn't have a very good night. And Matthew Libertor did not. He wasn't efficient, wasn't especially effective. You only get through four. Yeah, this was kind of a concern that I mentioned that could be coming with Matthew Libertor. Everybody kind of pegged him as the savior, and I said, hey, he needs to have a chance. Cardinals need to give him this opportunity, and, and that is not changed by what we saw tonight, even though Steven Matz also pitched in this game out of the bullpen and looked pretty decent in his uh, inning in a third. I wouldn't change anything about it. I would have Matthew Libertor run out there, but my whole point with Matthew Libertor when he came into the rotation and it was looking like the Cardinals were going to give him that prolonged chance was don't just expect him to be the savior and don't expect it to just look incredible right away. And we're, we're kind of seeing right now with, with Libby and with the Cardinals that it certainly does not look incredible. So that's where things are. We're going to get into it tonight on this edition of B-Shape Daily. Appreciate you guys for being alongside. Had a really fun live YouTube stream. What was it? Uh, Monday night. That went pretty well. You can go back and re-watch that on YouTube. If you missed it, you can listen to it on Spotify on the B-Shape Daily feed. Make sure you're following the podcast on Spotify if you haven't so far and you appreciate the content, helps me out if you do so. And even more than that, YouTube is a great place to catch up on all of the content that I put out as well in terms of audio content, video content, things of that nature. Go to YouTube.com and then type in my Twitter handle. It's slash at bshafer12, just like my Twitter. And hit the subscribe button on YouTube if you're watching slash listening right now on YouTube. Appreciate you for being there. Go ahead and like this video and make sure you are subscribed with the notifications on so you never miss an opportunity to hop into a live stream because we'll continue to do those, but we kind of toggle on and off and alternate. And tonight was a night where we're going with the old fashioned podcast. So appreciate you guys for being with me here tonight. Let's talk about this five game Cardinals losing streak. Shall we? It's starting to get, I mean, it's in that DEFCON one territory. There's no doubt about that. And it's starting to get ominous in a way that I don't even think it was this bad. The first time I know they lost eight in a row at one point during that stretch and they were 10 and 24 so that was 14 games below 500 with a much lesser winning percentage than the one that they have now sitting 12 games below 500 at 25 and 37. But this almost feels worse to me because at the time it was like, well, there are things that they can do. They can move 
a guy out of the rotation and they can bring up some young players and they can do whatever the hell it is that they did with Wilson Contreras, which was not something I was advocating for, but it was something to shake things up. And sometimes I think a clubhouse can get a little too complacent, even when you're losing and you think, well, that should be eating at these guys every day. Don't they care? I think they care. And that's what makes it so difficult to kind of square the circle that I am seeing with this team right now. And I characterized it on Twitter as such when I said the following at B Schaefer 12 on Twitter, watching this team too often feels like the Cardinals are sort of going through the motions. It feels bad to say, because then the implication is that they don't care. And I don't think it's that, but if they don't like the characterization, I guess my thought would be fix the play. That was the tweet I sent out earlier tonight at the conclusion of the six to four loss for the Cardinals. I, it's not, I, I never like to get into that area of effort because it's kind of a lazy territory to get into, especially when it's, you're talking about a road trip, right? So I'm watching the game on TV, just like the rest of the fans. And I'm not there covering, I'm not in the clubhouse. And so I don't even like to throw that out there of, well, they don't, these guys don't care because I don't see everything that goes into it. And I think that's important for fans to acknowledge acknowledge at times and I also know that people sometimes don't like that pragmatic sort of view because right now people want their pound of flesh and I've got angry people tweeting at me and talking about how I haven't been harsh enough on the Cardinals and all these things and I get it I think a lot of compared to a lot of Cardinals fans out there I've taken a more optimistic viewpoint with confidence that this team would make it back that they would figure out their issues that they would still win this pathetic NL Central well, they're eight and a half games back in the NL Central right now, and they're 12 games below 500. They are the worst team in the National League by winning percentage. Those are facts. I can't I can't sugarcoat those. They are what they are. They are 2-8 and eight in their last 10 games. That's also a fact. They've been abysmal on the road at 13-21. and 21. Another fact. They've been terrible at home at 12-16. and 16. An additional fact. And by the way, they're coming home this weekend to take on the Cincinnati Reds, who are suddenly looking like a competent bunch. Cardinals split with them at Great American Ballpark a couple of weeks ago, and now the Reds are 6-4 and four in their last 10. They just called up Ellie De La Cruz, the top shortstop prospect in that organization. He's an exciting young player. Cardinals are going to have to deal with him over the weekend. It's not necessarily getting any easier after this series wraps up with the Texas Rangers, who, by the way, are now 20 games above five hundred. even though they lost Jacob DeGrom to what I believe is going to be Tommy John surgery. Um, he, he might be getting the elbow repair. I don't know what the deal is, but he's he's out for the season, and the Rangers are humming along like like it's no problem whatsoever, uh, taking care of the Cardinals once again. All these things are going on. I have had an optimistic viewpoint in general of this team. It is hard to maintain that. It feels worse than it did when they were 10-24 and 24 because, again, I don't know what you go about fixing, and I know people are screaming at their phone or their computer or their headphones here, saying, what you fix is the manager. Fire Ollie. Everybody on Twitter, social media, people are getting on board with that idea. I, I'm i back to where I was when it was really getting bleak during that eight-game losing streak where I said, listen, I wouldn't fire the manager, but if it were to happen, I can't act like I'd be shell-shocked at this point just because they're running out of things to do. But... This also feels like a team where, again, not saying they don't care and that there's not passion. They find the moments for passion. We can look back to game one of this series, Wilson Contreras making things happen. We talked about this last night. When he's getting to third base on a stolen base, catching the defense napping, he is hyped up about it, man. The Cardinals need some of that energy. Andrew Kisner, I saw I saw a little bit from him tonight. He was uh, on the bench when Jordan Walker hit his moonshot, man, you can see in the video, Cardinals tweeted out the video of the home run. Bally Sports tweeted it out as well. As Jordan Walker's pointing around the bases, excited about his third big league homer, you got Andrew Kisner banging the railing and getting over the railing with some uh, emphatic clapping. Like, that's that's good. Well, he's the only guy in the dugout that was doing anything, by the way. If I were giving out a an Olympic podium for the reaction in the Cardinals dugout to the Jordan Walker home run celebration, and maybe you, you're you somebody who's out there and thinks, oh, this doesn't matter. Cardinals were down by two runs still at that point. What do they have to, to celebrate, honestly? Down to potentially extending a four-game losing streak into a five-game losing streak. I happen to look at it differently. There are things that 
you can only kind of get through being there. And I wasn't in Arlington, Texas tonight. I was watching it on television. But sometimes maybe I stray too far into thinking I shouldn't comment on certain things because, well, if I don't know the whole story, that that maybe ends up being a bad look. Here's what I saw, though, man. I saw Andrew Kisner trying to pump up the boys, and everybody else was just kind of like, yeah, all right, Jordan, at a, at a kid. If I were giving out the Olympic podium, it's Andrew Kisner with gold. I'm giving silver to Miles Michaelis for taking his right hand and banging the top of the railing one to two times. Again, this was just a quick little clip as the video was rolling of Walker rounding the bases. I'll put Miles on the silver for the podium, and I'm going to put Arenado on as bronze medalist for this uh, reaction to the home run because he was given a few claps there as well. But that dugout was dead, man. And again, I hate to be, that sounds like such a reactionary thing to say, but I noticed it. <laughs> I absolutely did. It was uh, it was something that a, a fan had pointed out to me via Twitter. And I said, well, I didn't look at it as it happened, but let me go back and watch the broadcast and see what I see. And at first I thought, oh, not so bad because Arenado uh, kind of daps him up when he gets into the, the dugout and, and kind of goes through the line and people give it. But it was like when it was fresh that this rookie sensation that the Cardinals really are going to need to be able to to get going if if he's going to contribute meaningfully to a, a comeback for this team in 2023. He hits a freaking bomb, man. It was an epic blast by Jordan Walker. And I thought the dugout just basically, you wouldn't have known it other than Andrew Kisner hooping and hollering. That's why he wears the C, man. That's the captain. Willie McGee said that's his captain. Gave him the C. I think they talked about it on Hot Take Central. I, I that's, that's the kind of energy he's bringing, man. I don't know. I think they could use more of it. I get it. You're down six to four, and so you're still probably looking at another L. Maybe everybody in the dugout, maybe that's how they felt. Maybe that's the problem, that there's not confidence that they can come from behind and, and change their fortunes right now. But, man, I did notice that. And maybe that's a very, like, fan reaction that I have as as somebody that covers this team in a, in a more of a professional capacity. Talked about not being a Cardinals-affiliated fan anymore. Back in, I was in high school, different story, but different world now. I don't care what the reaction is, dude. At some point, I just got to call it like I see it. And that is how I saw it tonight. It's like, really, that's all they could come up with for Jordan Walker? I don't know. Maybe I'm off base on that one. Let me know what you think, though, at bshafer12 on Twitter. Comment below in this YouTube video if you're watching on YouTube. If you're not, go to the video, youtube.com slash at bshafer12. It'll be the most recent post if you're listening to it on Wednesday, June 7th. Yep, I looked at it and thought, gee whiz, that's all they could come up with? I mean, this was a second decker from Jordan Walker. This guy's got all the potential in the world. And Miles Michael is, yep, hits the railing a couple of times. There's a guy in the background, like, wiping his face off with a towel. I don't know what to expect. It's not like I look in the dugout every single time a home run is hit. But I didn't see no hamburger phone. <laughs> and that's fine, by the way. The hamburger phone can, it kind of it was a little played out, especially when you're losing eight out of every ten games, as the Cardinals have done over the past uh, couple of weeks now. Two and eight over their last ten. Maybe you can't be banging the hamburger phone at that point in time. Oh, no, I see it, though. It was still up there. It's on the it's on the top of the dugout. That is so sad as I rewatch this video. Like, the hamburger phone's still there, but I, I don't know if anybody was on the call for Jordan Walker. Adam Wainwright talks about, well, we're always on the call. You know, we're always predicting and getting hyped up for our teammates. They need a little more of that, I think. They lose 6-4 to four tonight, and I get that this was a, a very kind of somber game. Whoops, dropped my mic. A very somber game for a team that had already lost four in a row coming in, and then you get down because of a little bit of a rough outing by Libertor, gave up the five runs, as I mentioned, four of them earned, and the big one coming on that swing there for Texas in the fourth inning, which was the final inning of, of work for Libby. Ball hit into the right center gap. Jordan Walker could not quite track it down with the bases loaded. And then a little bit of, you know, little league home run action. They were trying to inspire the uh, the runner. I believe this was a ball off the bat of Adolis Garcia, if I'm not mistaken. Did he come up with the big hit? No, it might have been, been Simeon. 
I don't know. Garcia was four for four. At this point, I don't even remember who hit the who hit the double. I think it was was Marcus Simeon. And ends up getting a couple of RBIs on that. The other run scores because the Cardinals were throwing the ball around, which is nothing nothing new compared to what they've been doing lately. And, uh, yeah, so you're down at that point. You're down 5-2. Rangers add a, a run there in the fifth inning after Libertor had departed. Verhagen gives that one up, makes it 6-2. Cardinals actually led this game on the R not a home run early, but that, that was short-lived as uh, Texas scoring at least one run in the second, third, fourth, and fifth inning. They scored in four straight innings to take that 6-2 to two lead, and so that's kind of the vibe of the clubhouse, the vibe of the dugout you kind of feel there, which is a little strange because Cardinals get two solo home runs there in the sixth. It was Contreras and Walker both getting a, getting a solo job in the sixth inning, so you're starting to mount that comeback a little bit, but they just didn't look that inspired by it. Like I said, I think those are the guys that you'd love to see Homer. If you're a Cardinals fan, Arenado, Contreras, Jordan Walker, yeah, sign up for that. I mean, th- those are guys that you need to get going. And you got those guys to hit home runs tonight. Arenado a, was a, a two-run bomb back in the first. That's all you get offensively. It's just another very kind of quiet, lackadaisical. Again, I'm not trying to put I'm not trying to put a pin on their passion and say, hey, they don't have passion. I'm not even really trying to talk about the effort because, again, I don't think that's a very responsible thing to do because it would be, I mean, that's the bold words to say, hey, these guys aren't giving effort. That's not what I'm saying. It just looks to me like they're sort of just going through the motions. Are not a homer tonight, but a couple of the other swings that he had, there was a half swing ground out that we saw. I mean, that's kind of the stuff that he was doing a lot of during the period where he was really struggling a few weeks ago. Homered in the game, so I'm not trying to rip the guy. It's just like the consistency right now I think is a problem. John Mozeliak told Bally Sports Midwest was asked, you know, the biggest problem going on right now, and he said, I think it's the consistency of the ball club. We got to continue to work toward that, work through that. A lot of sort of stay the course language, though, and I know that is rubbing Cardinals fans the wrong way right now. Because they don't want to see this team stay the course. They want to see a jolt. They want to see something injected, something galvanizing this group. And right now, I mean, you got three home runs in the same game, and that there was nothing galvanizing about it. The third one coming from Jordan Walker and the club, the not the clubhouse, but the dugout at the time was just very much mundane. All he talked about after the game, and I don't even know if this is out there. Like, Bally Sports didn't tweet it. I guess they've given up. <laughs> and I don't know what the circumstances of that are, by the way. I don't mean to criticize uh, Bally because I know that sometimes they might just have a, an intern or whoever it is responsible for posting that kind of stuff. Maybe they figured, eh, tonight, what's the point? Um, but after the loss, so I don't know if – I did watch the Ollie interview post game live. Um, Katie Wu, you could hear her asking several of the questions. Lynn Worthy from the Post-Dispatch, I think, is down there in Arlington as well. But Katie was asking – about some of the recent play and some of the maybe fundamental mishaps and lapses and things of that nature, which I think if you've been watching Cardinals games, you've seen, obviously, we've talked about them, the base running errors, some fielding miscues. They've kind of added up for this team and and come back to bite them in certain areas. It's been unavoidable. And Katie was asking about these things, and Ollie at first kind of challenged her a little bit and said, like, you know, what, what do you mean by that? What do you expand upon that? I, I thought it was a question that could stand on its own, but Katie did a nice job kind of reiterating. And all he said, well, I mean, his response was, well, you've got two infielders playing in the outfield right now. And while that is true of, of Tommy Edmond and Brendan Donovan, I would argue that Tommy Edmond has been above average as an outfielder, which was maybe not what I expected, but he's done a nice job. Brendan Donovan won a gold glove as a utility player because of his ability to play the outfield in part. So, you know, I, I don't think that the Cardinals' miscues as a team necessarily are all based on having Edmund and Donovan playing a lot of outfield right now because your entire starting outfield from the beginning of the season, essentially, is on the I.L. right now. I realize that Carlson was not part of that, but then when Walker got sent down, Carlson was kind of a mainstay guy. But you've got three outfielders on the injured list, and yes, you're playing a couple of infielders and Jordan Walker in the outfield. And of the three, Jordan Walker is the least capable defensive player of the three in the outfield which is not his fault. He's only been doing this for 10 months. 
He's been an infielder his entire life, and now he's a major league outfielder, and that's a lot to take in. But on the double that Libertor gave up, could have been caught probably by another outfielder, I thought. It's just, and again, the ball was hit deep, so it's not like it was a cheapie. It was a double for Simeon. But that, you know, those are things that are going on. I just thought it was very interesting that Ollie Marmel characterized it that way. Well, we've got infielders playing in the outfield. You do. You definitely do. I don't know that that explains Arenado just whiffing on a pop-up yesterday. I don't know if that explains Arenado and DeYoung miscommunicating on a, on a foul ground pop-up in yesterday's game. I don't think it explains the base running that happened in the eighth inning of yesterday's game when Tommy Edmond inex inexplicably does not score the go-ahead run on the Arenado double. Which, by the way, Bally did put out some video from that last night. And I only got a chance to look at it after we finished up the live stream on Monday. I absolutely do not agree with the way the Cardinals characterized this one at all. If you remember the play from Monday night, Arenado's double to left field. I think it ends up caroming off the left field wall, and so it takes a funny hop, which allows should allow the runners to just kind of be off to the races. Gorman did not get a good read off of it as the runner from second base, and he was only just a few steps beyond the second base bag to where Tommy Edmond, playing it a little bit halfway between first and second, sees it's going to drop and then takes off. Basically, Edmund nearly catches Nolan Gorman if you miss this play on Monday. Gorman starts hauling ass, round third base. He's going to score because, again, the ball was bouncing around there in left field a little bit. Tommy Edmund was right on his tail. I mean, within just a couple few strides, two or three strides behind him. And Edmund rounds third as well, just, again, nipping at the heels of Nolan Gorman. But the throw is nowhere coming. Tommy Edmund, fleet of foot, I know you can't pass Nolan Gorman, and so that that does kind of screw with your mind a little bit on a play like that. But Tommy Edmund, just in the moment, man, he, he gets spooked, and he, he goes diving back toward third base, and then he gets hung up between third and home because he sees Arenado was barreling forward, and he, you know, Arenado figured he's right on Gorman's tail. They're both going to score. I'm going to end up at third. Arenado would have made it to third. Edmund would have made it home. But in the end, that isn't what happened. They get him hung up between third and home because Tommy Edmond turns around and it was a blunder. Ran the Cardinals out of the inning, cost them a run, maybe more, because he would have had another man in scoring position with two outs. And the Cardinals end up losing the game 4-3 to three on Monday in the bottom of the ninth. Would have been a 4-3 to three lead at that point for the Cardinals. Who knows what you're able to do bullpen-wise to maybe keep it there if things had gone differently. And the way the Cardinals explained it was that Nolan Gorman was at fault for this play because he should have been more standing between second and third trying to read the fly ball rather than basically hugging just a few steps beyond the second base bag. And I just frankly don't agree. And I know it's maybe a lot to spend all this time on a play that happened last night, but I think it's sort of indicative of like when Cardinals fans say fire Ollie, I don't agree with them, but I also think there is just – at times, some misplaced responsibility and some misplaced expression of culpability in some of these issues like, hey, this was so-and-so's fault, and here's how we saw it. I have found myself disagreeing with Ollie Marmel on those things a number of times this season. I don't know what to make of that because, again, I'm still in Ollie's corner in terms of, hey, I think he's got the chops to be able to work through this. I'll only be able to say that for so long. If this team loses 90 games, I'm going to have questions about why Ali Marmel didn't do more as a manager. I'm going to question the roster that John Mozeliak built for sure because that, to me, is above all. Talked about all the pitchers that they had. Talked about the fact that they weren't going to delve too much into the starting pitching markets in the offseason, and maybe that ends up looking like a strategic mistake. That is absolutely a question that gets asked of Mo at the end of this season, man. Was it a tr strategic mistake? if this team doesn't end up getting back into playoff positioning. And boy, I, I shudder to think even about how he's going to answer that question if it should come. Team could lose 89 games. He could be asked if not pursuing pitching was a strategic mistake. And if I had to guess, he would say, well, a lot of the pitchers we would have been looking at ended up getting hurt or didn't pitch well. And so ultimately, it wasn't a mistake. I could absolutely see them losing 90 games and still having that be the response. It'd be wrong. It would be incorrect because you could look at guys like Nathan Avaldi, who the Cardinals, I think, are going to look at a little bit, not having to face him in that Rangers rotation. They'll get John Gray for the series finale on Wednesday, who's also having a great season. But my point is, 
Cardinals could be they had a guy like Evaldi. There were other free agent options out there that have turned out to pitch well this season. And just because the Cardinals didn't identify which guys those would be in terms of the, the wish list they had, if they would have pursued starting pitching, which of course then more recently Mozeliak told 101 ESPN that they did engage with a number of starters, but it was all the guys who have pitched bad or have been hurt conveniently, even though in January he said, no, we didn't engage. So riddle me that. But certainly the roster is going to be something we talk about, but I'll talk about Ali Marmel as well if ultimately he doesn't find a way to fix it. And right now, just the steady drumbeat of, yeah, we got to grind, we're frustrated, we're definitely frustrated, but we got to get it going. And then when Katie brings up a very relevant question of, hey, your guys' fundamentals is off the wall, she said it much more uh, respectfully and and effectively than I just did it, but hey, your, your fundamentals, what's going on, very uncharacteristic of this team. And he says, well, we've got two infielders playing in the outfield. It's like, no, 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 no. That's not what we're talking about. Let's get, talk about the base running that happened just last night that cost you guys or the, the errors or the plays not made by the infielders as well. Uncharacteristic for sure. And honestly, you could say the Cardinals have three infielders playing in the outfield. Jordan Walker is an infielder still by trade. He's been an outfielder for 10 months. It's not realistic to expect him to just suddenly be uh, you know, a major league average right fielder after just 10 months of playing the position. It's not realistic. Unfortunately, the Cardinals are in a spot where they almost need that from him because they need him to try to take away some of those hits over the head that the Cardinals pitchers are damn sure going to allow because they are pitch to contact staff. They don't miss a lot of bats. That's another issue with this team and the way that it was constructed. I don't think the Cardinals realize the extent to which rule changes like the shift ban and the pitch clock would impact their style of pitcher because when you're pitching to contact and you get that 15 seconds on the clock and Wilson Contreras puts down the pitch com and says, we're throwing this pitch, and you go, no, 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 I don't want to throw that. Now you've got eight seconds. It's like, oh, boy, better come up with a pitch. Pitch clock is a factor there, right, with a new catcher as well, new pitching coach as well. And then you've got the shift band, which I think is even more of a factor. I think it's taken the Cardinals infielders a little bit out of their element to not always be able to be positioned as effectively as they might like to be with a with a pitching staff that is as pitch to contact as any pitching staff in MLB, I would I would venture to say, based on the fact that they don't strike out a ton of guys. And when you look at the NL leaderboards among the starting pitchers, or among all pitchers really, that have allowed the most hits, you've got Miles Michaelis at the top, you've got Jordan Montgomery coming into the day tied for third in the most hits allowed in the NL, and oh, Steven Matz is tied for fifth, even though he's not even a starter anymore. This was all coming into today's games. I don't know how those numbers may have changed. And Adam Wainwright's allowed more hits per inning than any of those names. So that's 80% of your starting rotation, essentially, for the majority of the season. Uh, Libertor now taking the spot of Steven Matz for the time being. And tonight he gave up his fair share of hits as well. So all of this is going on, and I find it just interesting. I've kind of talked in a circle a little bit, but it's all relevant. But I find it interesting when it comes to Ali Marmel talking last night about that base running play, which, again, tonight it was, well, infielders in the outfield. Yes, that's true, but no, that's sort of not getting to the heart of the question of really all the, like, the extent of the fundamental issues with this Cardinals team over the past few days. A big part of it was Monday night, but I still feel like they assigned the blame to the wrong person a little bit when it came to that. I can actually go back and play some of this. It'll be all courtesy of Bally Sports, but I want to make sure I'm not just paraphrasing, I'm referencing what Ali Marmel had to say about it. And, and that kind of sets the tone for this, by the way, because Arnado and Gorman then both were kind of apologetic and said, hey, it's on me. Arnado said, I've got to run with my head up and, and realize if Edmund's not going home, I can't go to third. Got to be aware of that. Gorman says, yeah, I was a little too... I actually might even play Gorman for you too because even in his answer, you realize like this is BS. It was not on Nolan Gorman. And so it's just weird to me that the that they fixate on Nolan Gorman of, of the situation. But here's Ollie Marmel from last night, courtesy of Bally, on the base running blunder in the eighth. This is from Monday's game. Uh, yeah, ideally, uh, with one out there, you're not tagging up. You're a little further off the bag. It allows Eddie to go further as well. And uh, potentially both of them end up getting waved. Well, here's where I disagree with that, because as far as I'm aware, they both did end up getting waved. I don't think it was the third base coach telling Edmund to pull up after he had already rounded the third base bag. I think he got spooked on his own. I don't know if they talked to Edmund after the game, which again, you're in the visiting clubhouse there in Arlington. And so I don't know what, what guys were available, what guys were on the bus. You know, I, I, I wasn't there, so I can't claim to know, 
I'll tell you when I know something. I'll tell you when I don't know something. In this case, I don't know. But to me, Edmund would have been the guy that I would have liked to have heard from the most rather than Arnato expressing contrition for, I, I do understand his part of it where he says, I got to run with my head up. But the way he described it was balls caroming off the left field wall. At that point, when I see it bounce away, I know I can get to third. But with part of that, you got to know that Edmund's scoring. But his just assumption is that he would, because why wouldn't he? And I don't know why he's wrong about that. I mean, yes, in the moment, he should be looking to see that. But Edmund did round the third base bag and and just kind of retreated at that point to get himself stuck. And then he had to go home because Arnado was bearing down to third and they were caught. But in general, I don't disagree at all with Arnado's assessment of the way that play unfolded. Gorman should have scored. Edmund should have scored. Here's the other part of it. Nolan Gorman did score. He did. Even though he wasn't halfway between second and third, he scored, which tells you probably fine to tag up. Because if the ball does get caught on a dive or something, he can tag from second to third and get there. Now, the value from being on second base with two outs versus third base with two outs is not substantial and wouldn't be worth the risk if there was any chance of being thrown out trying to make that play tagging up. But if it's a diving play or whatever, there's no risk in it because if the ball does get down, which it did, Gorman knows that he can still score from second base even if he's basically hugging the bag and tagging. And he was right. He did score, but it comes down to Tommy Edmond not scoring because of having Gorman in such close proximity in front of him that evidently we're acting like Edmond couldn't have, if he had set his mind to do so, just scored three steps behind Gorman and just kept on going. There would not have even been a throw. I maintain that it would not have been a close play at home. Edmond would have been up easily. I don't understand how the proximity between he and Nolan Gorman is even remotely relevant other than to just kind of F with your mind a little bit, which I'm sure it does as a base runner. But I just don't see how it makes a difference because Tommy Edman can still be free to score. He doesn't have to tackle Nolan Gorman. He doesn't have to pass him. All you got to do is just keep running, though. Keep running three strides behind him, and you're up. And so it's just weird to me that they that they characterized it in that way when it came to Nolan Gorman. We'll play the audio from Gorman here. And see what you think about that. Uh, that's on me. I messed up. Um, one hour, I should be getting out there a little more. Um, you know, score. The ball gets down and still be in, in running scoring position um, with two outs if he catches that ball. Um, but, yeah, it's on me. Messed up. He, he didn't mess up. I'll cut it off because he didn't mess up. It's not on him. Yeah, he probably should have been more a little between second and third. It shouldn't make a difference. It should not make a difference how close Tommy Edmond is to him. Tommy Edmond knows that he can't pass a base runner in front of him. That's all he needs to be thinking about. He still could have scored. I'm not trying to harp on Tommy Edmond, but the reason I bring it back up is because I don't agree with the way the Cardinals described it. All he says, ideally, you want Gorman to be. No, ideally, you want Tommy Edmond to keep running because he would have been safe. He doesn't have to think about anything other than just score. If the third base coach is waving you around, which I believe he was, and if I'm wrong on that, then the whole thing goes up in smoke, and that's my B. If the third base coach at some point told Edmund, no, 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 go back, and I'd have to see, you know, I'd have to see the angle of the play. I didn't, I did not notice in the play that I watched the replay of whether or not that had happened. But if he's being waved around, that's all he needs to know. Just keep running. Don't pass the guy in front of you. That goes without saying. Other than that, there's nothing you need to think about. And I don't, I, I'm not trying to rip Tommy Edmond more than is necessary because I think he's a, a smart ball player and a very good Cardinal. Fans are trying to say, oh, what could they get in the trade for Tommy Edmond all the time? And I'm thinking, how about don't? How about play him every day? He's a really good player. But in this case, he had a blunder. I don't think it was Nolan Gorman's blunder. I think that's just kind of a weird way to misassign the culpability a little bit on this whole deal. The responsibility for the way it went down. And that's weird to me. And so I don't think it's that it's not the end of the world, but it's just like there's there's been those little little nuggets I think throughout the season where it's like Ollie, I don't I don't know if I saw that the same way. Now this is just one of those things though where it's like some Cardinals fans totally are going to agree with Ollie and say, hey, Gorman's got to be that's just baseball talk at that point. I'm okay with somebody disagreeing with me, but I wanted to point it out because I just thought it wasn't something that I necessarily agreed with. And then tonight you got the explanation of well infielders in the outfield. I just don't really know if that is fully fully uh, explaining what's kind of going on with the Cardinals from a fundamental standpoint. 
But those things do cause everybody a little bit to press, I think, defensively. Can't shift like you need to be able to do on the infield, and you've got a bunch of infielders playing in the outfield where everybody might not be the most comfortable, and the margins, if I've ever said this, let me know. Stop me if I've said it before. The margins are slim. Yeah, they are. I have said it before because it remains true. Again, the Cardinals lose tonight by two runs. They lose last night by one run. Over the weekend, they lost three games by a grand total of four runs. They are losing these close games, and they have not found a way to get over the hump on them, and they almost seem resigned to the fact at this point that they're not going to win these close games. When you make it 6-4, to four, it's like they had already gotten into a mindset in a headspace of, oh, this isn't a close game. We can just kind of coast to the finish. And then Jordan Walker homers, and nobody knows how to act. They're like, oh, well, I guess, are we in this again? And Kisner's like, hell yeah, we're in this. You know, pumping people up. And not a whole lot of action from the other guys in the dugout there. So, again, I, you let me know what you think about that. Did you see the play in the dugout? It's not a play, but did you see the reaction in the dugout after the Jordan Walker home run? Anything to that? Am I making too much of it? I, again, I don't think it's the end-all, be-all to say, oh, here's the smoking gun. Cardinals don't care. Not what I'm trying to say. It just surprised me a little bit, and I feel like those are the kinds of things we can talk about on this show and gauge kind of the, the temperature of Cardinals fans. What did you think of now that we've heard? And again, this is kind of old old hat at this point, but as it as it pertains to what Ollie said tonight about infielders in the outfield, when he was asked about some of the fundamental issues going on with the Cardinals, and that's not something we can play. All all the audio we did play courtesy of Bally, but that's not something they posted. What do you think about that? Do you, do you think that's an oversimplification and maybe not addressing some of the the core issues? which I think, you know, infielders are making mistakes as well. Base runners are making mistakes as well. And last night, now that we've gotten to hear the audio and, and talk about that a little bit on the show, what do you think? At B. Shaver 12, let me know. Watching the play, they, they don't show Pop Warner the entire time in the angle that I saw. They He was waving him around when it was Gorman. Edmund was only a couple feet behind him, so I can't imagine that he suddenly threw up the stop sign for Edmund. But maybe he did, and it just didn't get shown on the camera. I will say, I mean... I think Edmund scores with ease if he just keeps running. I, I don't think he gets thrown out at the plate. I think you're forcing the defense to make an exceptional play. I will say, much better chance that Edmund scores if Gorman is further along. Gorman should have been further along. I don't think it is as relevant as it was made out to be like it's all Gorman's fault. Yes, Edmund had to break his stride a little bit going around second. He still could have scored because of the way the ball car- caromed around. It was bounced around out there. I think you you send it, you go. Once you decide not to do that, there is a mistake on Arenado. You got to be looking, but it doesn't really matter who you blame. I think you could you could assign a little bit of blame to all three players, honestly, in that in that base running blunder. The two Nolans took more of the brunt of it, whereas I still believe Tommy Evan probably just could have kept running and uh, see what happens at home plate. Because again, if he was so close to Nolan Gorman that it was that noticeable. They didn't throw home for Gorman. They weren't trying to get him. I don't know that the extra stride and a half would have made the difference and they could have gotten Edmund at the plate, but who knows? But let me know what you think about all that at B Schaefer 12 on Twitter. Comment here on the YouTube channel. If you're watching this video on YouTube, let me know what your thoughts are on the entire fundamental lapses that we're seeing right now for the Cardinals, which I think it happened right in April and happened a little bit in early May as that eight game losing streak was going along. And then when the Cardinals lost in Pittsburgh over the weekend, there was the quote from the John Denton story that we read in, I guess it was Monday's episode, where I talked about how Ollie said, no, not effing close or whatever he said when comparing sort of the the way things are going for this team right now to when things were at their worst, falling to a 10-24 and record. He said, no, it's not comparable because we were losing games in all sorts of ways back then, and now we, you know, we're just getting beat handily by a team being better than us. Straight up, we're playing fine ball, but we're not coming through with opportunities, but we're not losing it on the fundies. It was kind of, the, I think, the implication there from Ollie on Sunday after they lost Game 3 of that Pirates series and, and made it a sweep. Monday and Tuesday in Texas, I think, have been very much those kinds of April losses that make you scratch your head and go, what is going on with this Cardinals team? Can't happen forever, guys. It cannot happen forever. I don't even know if I would be considered among the, like, Ollie support group in terms of media members. You know, I think a lot of media members probably view it relatively similarly because they talk to him daily. 
uh, especially the folks that travel on the road, which I haven't been doing this season, obviously, because of the baby at home. But, like, I don't know that there are people in the media that cover this team on a daily basis that would say fire Ollie. And I don't know why I even bring that up if that's to say, <laughs> take a little bit of slack off of me to say, hey, it's not just me that would say, I don't know if the manager is fixing this thing. By firing him, you're not just suddenly injecting the magic potion. I think maybe that's why I bring it up, just to take a little bit of the heat off myself, selfishly. But I also say it because I, like, I'm not crazy out there to think that this is unexpected from what we're seeing of an Ali Marmel team. Because I think he's a sharp guy with a good handle on things. But how the Cardinals respond to this kind of adversity and this unprecedented way of losing, I think is very telling. If they continue to just kind of say, hey, stay the course, stay the course, and then you realize that the course you're on has an iceberg and the ship you're on is the Titanic, and then it's too late, that's going to look bad in retrospect. I'm going to have egg on my face. The Cardinals are going to have egg on their face if that's the way this ends up going. If they don't over the course of the next 100 games because you've got 100 left, you've played 62, you've got 100 more. If they don't find a way to right the ship to at least some extent, to where they're going to win 84, 85 games, which I know you can tell me they need a hundred win pace to do that. They need a, I don't care about the pace because we've seen this team rattle off five, six wins in a row or 11 of 14 or whatever it was like. They're capable of doing those things. Don't give me the pace. Never tell me the odds, right? Han Solo. I really don't care about the, the pace stuff because nobody expects the Cardinals to go on a pace of 0 and 162 for eight games in a row. And then to do it again for five games in a row now the way that they are. The pace stuff is a little overrated. I get why it I get why you look at it, but I I just don't need it. It doesn't have any value to me, especially this early in the season. When sure there is time to go on a hundred win pace for the next hundred games. Uh well they're not gonna win a hundred out of a hundred, but you could have a pace of, you know, a, a six fifty winning percentage or something over that hundred game stretch. You could win sixty five, especially if you rattle off an eight out of ten. And then, you know, you don't, you tread water for a week or two and then bam, it's an 11 out of 14 again. And suddenly it's the, the pace ends up working itself out. So those things are definitely possible, but the Cardinals have got to figure out a way to do it. And that is the hardest part because right now they don't look like a team that's close in any of those areas. It's been the whack-a-mole theory of, Hey, tonight it was pitching. Didn't really do you any favors because your starter gave up five runs. Defense didn't really do you any favors because one of those runs was unearned, and you could even think if the right fielder was Tommy Edmond, that, that ball in the gap maybe gets tracked down over the right shoulder of Jordan Walker, and then maybe they, they don't score any more runs in that inning, and the Cardinals win 4-2. to two. I mean, the, that's, a fa- that's a factor in this. I'm not saying it would have happened that way, the butterfly effect and so on, but that's a thing that happened where I, th- I saw that ball to Walker and thought, oh, my gosh, if he was just a little bit – quicker on a first step it's not I don't think he had a bad read necessarily it was hit well but sometimes you see above average defenders making plays like that and Walker just couldn't get to it and that's the reality of having infielders in the outfield and they have to do it because they've got Arenado at third and they made Jordan Walker an outfielder and the other outfielders are injured and so that's where you're at right now but it's a part of the reality of where they are but it's impacting each area of the game On Monday, it was just simply another game where you're not coming through with your offensive opportunities. You lose a game four to three. Adam Wainwright only gave up three runs. And you have the base running blunder in the eighth. You have a couple of drop pop-ups here and there. Uh, The one in the bottom of the ninth by Arenado ends up leading directly to the walk-off run. Base it to left field. Mercado makes a bad throw home. I don't know if it was one where even a plus arm gets him but it was a terrible throw. I mean, these things are just the reality of where the Cardinals are right now, and it's it's popping up in almost every area of their game. If you give them nine innings, they're going to find a way to blunder two or three of the things where you go, oh, my gosh, that just doesn't happen. That's so uncharacteristic. I don't know how many times we can keep saying it's uncharacteristic before it just becomes characteristic of what they are in 2023. 100 games to go, and so the sample size, you got to keep it in mind. you got to keep it proportional. It's still smaller than what it's going to be. The 62 games they've played, they're going to play a whole nother 62 games just like they did, and then they're going to play another you know, 38 games beyond that. How do you like that quick math? So there's still plenty of baseball left to be played, and if they play the next 62 differently than the last 62, they'll go into the final stretch of the season with a shot. But it, 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 they got to probably do it a little bit sooner than later so that 
the front office can go, well, yeah, we probably should add to this team, which, by the way, they should do regardless. They just shouldn't add any rentals if they're out of it. If they're out of it, you should still be adding. You should be trading the rentals that you do have and then acquiring a Dylan Cease or whatever keeper pitcher that you think you're going to have for an ace next year because don't let the Cardinals go into the offseason needing that ace in free agency because it is going to be bad news if that's the way it plays out. Trade for that guy. Do it regardless of the team's record, by the way. So those are some of the things going on. It's It feels like freaking deja vu all over again because we have the similar conversations about this team on almost a nightly basis during these losing streaks, man. It's never been less fun to do these these uh, podcasts, these B-shaped dailies and the lives than when this team is losing every day for eight days in a row or every day now for five games in a row. And you go, I don't know what to say different than yesterday, folks. I'm sorry. <laughs> I really don't. But that's kind of the feel of it right now. Seven hits tonight for the Cardinals. You get three walks. So you get your base runners. You scatter them. 0 for 4 with risk. Seven left on base. It's the same story. It's the same as it ever was. This team is still like among the tops in the league in batting average and OPS with runners in scoring position. I think in batting average, they're like 10th or so. But in uh, OPS, they're like two or three in MLB. The Rangers, by the way, are number one. The Rangers are number one in everything. Best offense, one of the best pitching staffs. It's unbelievable. Mike Maddox represent. But like this Cardinals team somehow is still toward the top half in those categories. And there is no way that holds up if they keep playing the way they have over the past 10 days or so. It's been absolutely pathetic with runners in scoring position. And it's almost like once they get somebody in scoring position, that the task has been achieved, the the objective has been completed, and then just whatever happens, just kind of get get through the motions, go through the motions, make you know, do your thing. The intent is not there in the at bats right now. It's not that they don't care. I'm not questioning effort. I am talking about the execution of the intent of these at-bats is lacking. And I put it more on the offense for this team right now than I do the pitching. That's true even on a night where they gave up six runs because I think Libertor is going to be a work in progress. Yes, I still run him out there for another six or seven starts, getting him into mid-July. And then you make a decision, and by then you've hopefully traded for a starter because you probably need to do that regardless. It's not always just about this season either. You're trading for a guy under team control beyond this year, and then you extend him. That's the hope. And that's going to require probably trading from your big league roster. Some tough decisions are going to need to be made. If John Mozeliak is going to lead them out of this and, and going to kind of make sure his legacy with this team ends on a high note, and I do say ends because within a couple of years, he's going to be gone, or at the very least, he's not going to be in charge of this team as the president of baseball operations. That day is coming, so the fire mo crowd, you're not getting your wish on that, but he is going to be ushered out of his own volition here before too long. If he's not the guy to be able to make the trades at this deadline to fix this thing and to get it right back on track before the end of 2023, but certainly with an eye on making sure it's there ready to go day one of 2024, if he's not going to be the guy to make those moves, and I think there needs to be some bold moves and it's going to be a little scary and it's going to feel a little risky, but if he's not the guy to do it, then go ahead and hand over the reins now to Gersh or Randy Flores or whoever it's going to be and see and see what they come up with. Because you might as well just get a jump on if that's really the way this deadline's going to go. I am absolutely fascinated to see what John Mozeliak does at the trade deadline because I think he needs to be as active as he's ever been. Not because they need to sell the farm to make sure they win in 2023. No, the record is going to dictate that as they get a little closer. How aggressive they can be in terms of short-term buying opportunities. I think they need to be looking at the mid to long-term buying opportunities as well. If you've got a pitcher that's available for three, four years, or even two, three years, whatever that looks like remaining of team control, and he's an ace caliber name, boy, oh boy, could the 2024 Cardinals use that just as much as a 23 version of the team, if not more, because you'll have that guy for a full season of 2024, 2025, and not just the sprint to the finish of 2023, late July, into August through September. That's something the Cardinals need regardless of what their record is. But if they're close-ish, I will be very fascinated to see what happens. And if they're not close-ish, because right now they're not, the division's so bad, they're only eight and a half games back despite being the worst team in the National League by record. The third worst team in Major League Baseball. I mean, if the season ends today, if I'm not mistaken, I think the Cardinals are drafted number three. 
That's not somewhere they've ever been under John Mosnaylock. I don't believe they were ever there either under Walt Jockety. I mean, you're talking about decades of Cardinal baseball where they haven't been this bad. Looking in the American League, you got the Royals, you got the Athletics, who, by the way, the Athletics thumped the Pirates today. Riddle me that. The worst freaking team in baseball. They trailed their own division by 28 and a half games behind the Texas Rangers. Rangers are 40 and 20. The A's are 13 and 50. And yet, the A's pummeled the Pirates today, a team the Cardinals just got swept by. A's win that one 11 to 2. Cardinals are the third worst team in baseball, and it's not even like remotely close. Well, that's not true. The the Rockies are a game back of the car or a game ahead of the Cardinals, I should say. And the Nationals are a game and a half ahead of the Cardinals. Something like that. No, just yeah, they're both a game. Game differential between the two. But the Cardinals are the worst team in the National League, worst, worst team, third worst team in Major League Baseball. I don't know what it's going to look like if their record is this way when you get close to the deadline. There's a lot of people going, do you trade Paul Goldschmidt with his contract coming up here pretty soon? Would you think about moving Goldie? Reigning MVP looking pretty similar to how he has in terms of the numbers. 890 OPS is still pretty solid. One for four tonight with a walk as well, run scored. Would you trade him? Would you get a haul for Goldschmidt? That pisses me off that it's even a conversation be honest with you. I don't think it's something you do. I think I think Paul Goldschmidt, yes, he's 35. Yes, he'll turn 36 in September of this season. But I think it is crazy with, with how good of a player he is and has been. would be crazy to me to think about Paul Goldschmidt not finishing his career with the Cardinals, having a next contract, because he's still playing at such a high level. He is offensively a juggernaut defensively I I still think he's one of the best in the game and so to me I just think it would be a foregone conclusion that he would sign an extension because even though he's going to be in his upper 30s there's a Cardinals team that's benefiting from his presence and you know they 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 should continue to be winning every year because that's the expectation but 2024 is the final year of his contract and so team might look at it and go we're getting a year and two months of Paul Goldschmidt, that might be worth a lot on the trade market. I refuse, though. Cardinals fans are already there, which is amazing to me how fast some Cardinals fans have gone, oh, yeah, they need to sell because you need to build for the future. Cardinals fans, a lot of y'all don't even know, and I'm in this group, not as a fan, but as somebody who grew up a Cardinals fan and has watched Cardinals baseball my entire life. I'm almost 29 years old, still just 28. I say just, even though, you know, kind of getting old. But there's a lot of people, if you're my age or younger, you don't remember ever a time where the Cardinals have sold at the trade deadline or have, heaven forbid, rebuilt and said, oh, it's not happening for the next couple of years. Let's go ahead and sell off the veterans that have value and rebuild, which is an implication if you're doing that with a guy like Goldsmith that you're also not going to compete in 2024 is what you'd be saying. Either that or you're saying the chance that we compete isn't high enough or isn't good enough to consider passing up on this opportunity to cash in on the prospect value right now of a Paul Goldschmidt because he'd be one of the biggest names, if not the biggest name on the trade market, pending what happens with Shohei Otani, which I am skeptical that he gets dealt. But that would be a huge name. I will not entertain the conversation. Not not at this point on the podcast. You Talk to me in a month. I don't even want to answer another question about should they trade Goldschmidt. But if it's July and they're still this bad, then we we can maybe start talking about it. But my thing is it's crazy to me, as I mentioned, how quickly Cardinals fans have just been okay with it. They've assimilated and said, oh, this team should sell. And I don't know if people think it makes you a smart fan. It makes you savvy to go, oh, I know the market. And I know that this is what the Cardinals need. Or if it's if it's that or if it's a fear of like, just don't want to be caught in the middle perpetually because it's kind of been where the Cardinals have been. They've been in the middle. They've at least always made the playoffs the last four years, 19, 20, 21, 22. Missed it the three years before that, made it a bunch before that, but never, you know, they haven't been to the World Series since 2013, haven't won it since 11. Kind of have that feeling of just kind of perpetually being in the middle. And that's not a great place to be because it's a hard place to build from 
You're always drafting toward the middle to back, but you're not ever getting to enjoy the champagne of a World Series championship. Even a, a postseason series, I think Cardinals fans would would take some solace in and be happy to win one of those at this point. That's been since 2019 since they've done that, getting to the NLCS. And then, of course, not winning a game when they got there, which is what allowed me to explore Washington, D.C. on a full Wednesday before, I think it was Wednesday, before heading back on a flight the next day. I was in D.C. for that series, and I had a full day free because they got bounced earlier than anticipated. So, yeah, it's been a while since the Cardinals have had that playoff success, and some fans maybe just don't want to be caught in the middle, and they can sense that that might be the area this ends up moving to. And so in their head, they say, hey, just rebuild. Sell off the pieces. Maybe you tank for a year or two. I am telling you what, you don't mean it. (laughs) You do not mean it. That's my prediction, Cardinals fans. You are not willing or as willing as you think you are to sit through some legit bad baseball where they're purposefully going, yeah, this is a rebuilding year, like from day one, from April 1st. It ain't an April Fool's joke. It's a, no, we're really rebuilding. You do not have the level of comfort with that as a Cardinals fan that you think you do. Comment below on this YouTube video if you disagree with me. I just contend that any Cardinals fan that is boldly saying, hey, they should sell, I I know how baseball works. Sometimes you got to sell off these short-term assets and restock the farm. Totally get it. I don't think, first of all, that Cardinals fans should let this front office off the hook. Absolutely not should John Moselak get to oversee a rebuild. And don't worry, he wouldn't. Because, again, if they lose 90 games this year, he's probably done. Not because he gets fired, but because he probably goes, all right, this didn't go the way that we, we thought it would. And for as much as I'd like to preserve my legacy here, I think the best way to maybe do that is to not overstay my welcome. And if we're talking about a peaceful transition of power for the betterment of the organization, and we just lost 90 games, it's probably just time for me to go ahead and move into an advisory role or whatever the the terminology would be. David Stearns did it with Milwaukee year, year and a half ago, whatever it was. I think you would see the exact same thing. If the Cardinals do not have it pan out where they improve this thing and turn it around. I think there's a better than equal chance that Mo would not be the president of baseball operations for the 2024 season. I'm talking about next year. I'm not saying you'd be fired. Make sure you're listening carefully to how I, how I frame this because I think there's a huge distinction. Bill DeWitt's not firing John Moselak. It won't happen. If it happens, I'll just be the, the guy that has to come on a B shape daily the next day and go, guys, the unthinkable happened. I told you for, years and years that it would never even materialize. It couldn't happen. And then it did. Then I'll have to, I'll have to, you know, I'll have to wear that a little bit, but otherwise I'm saying it could be that if the Cardinals don't turn this around as a collaborative organization, they go, this is the new direction. We're going to turn over the new leaf and we're going to start it a little earlier, a year, year to two years earlier than we thought we would, because we recognize that we've, we've got to make some changes and it might just be more fair to everybody involved that rather than sort of be in a lame duck territory with that contract, because again, I think by 2025, they were going to begin that transition regardless. We don't know yet how 2023 is going to play out. Pending that, I I think you could see change ahead of 2024. I I think almost a guarantee John Moselak will not be in the same role that he is right now in 18 months, right? Because that would be 12 months would get us to June of 24, Another six would be December of 2024. He won't be in that role anymore going into the 2024 slash 25 offseason. He might still be called the Pobo, but it'll be with people always have said for years, well, what does Mike Gersh do? No, he does plenty, but it's just, it's very behind the scenes. It won't be by then. Or if it's Randy Flores that is elevated from scouting director, it won't be by then that he's behind the scenes. There will be... uh, a much greater degree of input, which is not to say there's not already input from a collaborative front office perspective, but I'm saying regardless of the way these next 18 months go, I already believe that that's going to be the case, that Mo will, the role, the title might change. If the the title doesn't, the responsibilities certainly will by then. That's what he described anyway in February down in Jupiter when he talked about this new contract, which runs through 2025. But my point with all of this is Mo if he ends up building this roster that causes the first losing season since 2007, since he took over, that October took over, so he's never had one yet, 
And it's not to say, hey, one losing season, pal, you're out. Like, that's not been what they've been operating under for the whatever it's been, 16 years that he's been in charge. It's not that simple. But I do think with where the organization is right now and knowing that he's coming up toward the end of his contract anyway and of his own volition wants to move on to something else beyond that 2025 deal. Knowing all those things, I don't think you can reasonably say, yeah, Mo, start this rebuild off for us, and then we'll hand off the reins to somebody else in a year or two. No, I just think if you're going to go that route, you have somebody else oversee it, and you you make the break after 2023. But I also don't think that Cardinals fans would be as as cool with it as they say they would be because they've never experienced it. Now, Cardinals fans in their 30s or 40s, you've probably seen different Older than that, you've seen a lot of baseball that I haven't seen. So I don't claim to know it all. But I'm talking to my generation and younger or folks that are kind of in the in the lower 30s, kind of close in age to me. I don't think you realize what that would be like, what that summer would be like. Right now it sucks. You might say, I do know it's happening right now the way they're playing. But no, I'm talking about you don't have expectations and it would be foolish of you to have them coming into a season because everybody knows – Everybody understands the plan. It's a rebuilding year. I don't think Cardinals fans should be so quick to allow that, to let this organization off the hook for squandering potentially the prime, the, the, the latter prime years of Paul Goldschmidt, the latter prime years of Nolan Arenado, having Wayno in his final season, which, again, he's got to contribute more than he has been if that's going to be a factor. And then you talk about if you were to admit trading a, a – Paul Goldsmith is the right move. That's basically saying wash away 2024. But it would if you go Arenado as well, you're saying, all right, how many years in the future are we basically saying this is a a done deal that's no good? All that does is is give Bill DeWitt the freedom to lower the payroll. If they're going to trade off their contracts and be able to get something for them, which again, you could get good value, I think, for Goldsmith. Arenado, more years on the deal. I don't think it's a bad, you know. I, it's a, it's a pretty team friendly, I still think, deal relative to some of the deals they got signed in the off season. But you'd have to find a taker at the deadline to say, "Hey, we want this deal, and we'll give you pieces for it." That's tricky. It's why the Cardinals in the first place were able to take advantage of the Rockies because, well, in that off season, Rockies wanted rid of the money, and the Cardinals had the the landing spot where they were happy to take it on. Which again, it's crazy that no other team were willing to do that. But also, Arenado wanted to be in St. Louis, and so. It happened. But I look at all of these factors and go, you're if you're a Cardinals fan that says trade away these these guys who are still in their primes, I get it. Paul Goldsmith is going to be 36, and so age-wise, that's not it. The guy's in great shape. I still think he's got multiple years of success. I don't think you sign him to a four-year extension, but two with an option maybe I think is reasonable for 25, 26. Depends how long he wants to play. Maybe he wants to be done after the current contract. That We don't know, but... But to basically say 2024 and maybe 2025 would be kind of a wash, and we'd be admitting that and saying, hey, let's just rebuild. You're admitting that through Nolan Gorman's pre-arbitration years where you don't have to pay him very much and you can build payroll flexibility around that, these Cardinals aren't going to win. Through the pre-arb years of Jordan Walker and beginning of Mason Wynn, potentially, through guys like Brennan Donovan, you know, Tommy Edmond, then he's getting into arbitration. You're just saying all these things that are advantages to a payroll, we're not going to worry about the flexibility that that affords because we don't think we're going to win the next couple of years. It does no good unless you're getting some elite prospects, which do you really believe it would happen that way? The worst thing would be Cardinals fans kind of get on board with going, all right, it's a losing year. Goldsmith's got some legit value because he's got two months plus a year that he can contribute to another team. Cardinals can get some dudes. And then they make that trade and you go, they got who? Oh, come on. That'd be the worst thing that could happen. Very, very intrigued to see kind of how it plays out. But that'll be hopefully the last time for a month or so that I engage in that level of discussion about, should the Cardinals start trading some of their veterans like Goldsmith, Arenado? Because I just don't think that's something that Cardinals fans should stand for, to be totally honest with you. That would be a black mark on this organization if they had to resort to that. Even if it nets them a couple of nice prospects, I don't think it's the right way. I don't think Cardinals fans should just be so quick to stand for it. But I get I get it in the era of everybody knows who the prospects are. 
and that's exciting, and it gives you something to look forward to. I get why some people might feel that way. No, I don't think that should be an option at this trade deadline. Absolutely not. Talk to me in a month, and maybe I'll feel differently if they're really stinking up the joint still. But that's where I stand on that topic as of right now. Uh, Not saying you couldn't make trades from the big league roster. I think you kind of need to. And if they're out of it, you do trade Flaherty and Montgomery without a second thought. And you maybe do trade a reliever or two, guys like Helsley that I think are valuable, especially if they if Helsley you know starts pitching really well and, and pumps up his value before the deadline, and he's got only two years of team control left. And so you could say, all right. And, and again, why is it different for relievers versus when I say 2024, 2025 need to matter? Well, relievers are fickle in general. You've seen what the Cardinals got for guys like Alex Reyes. Nothing. He left for nothing. Jordan Hicks is going to leave for nothing. Um, but he's another guy you could trade, by the way. Probably has more value than Helsley if he continues pitching the way he has recently. But he's on a you know expiring team control, and so he's going to be a free agent this coming year. So as much as I think Jordan Hicks is pitching well, if the Cardinals get to a point where they're legitimately out of it in, in mid to late July, then yeah, you trade Montgomery, you trade Flaherty, you trade Hicks. And you get what you can as long as those guys have some value and you're not playing on re-signing them. Um, which, as of right now, I don't think any of the three will be back, but time will tell. We'll talk more trades, though. It's going to happen because one way or another, the Cardinals are either going to be out of it, it's all we'll have to talk about, or they're going to be fighting their way back into it, and we'll be saying, okay, what type of deadline does this team need to have to maybe finish the job and get them back into the race? No matter what it is, we'll be right here on b Shape Daily talking about it. Follow on Spotify, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, and please do subscribe to the Brendan Schaefer St. Louis Cardinals writer YouTube channel. Make sure you like the videos as they pop up on your screen and subscribe, comment below. Let me know what you think of the content as we continue to uh, create it all season long, regardless of how creative the Cardinals are with their ability to win games. Appreciate you guys, though, as always, for listening. That's going to do it for this edition of B-Shape Daily. We're done for now. Thank you guys so much, and we'll talk to you next time on B-Shape Daily. Peace.